this stretched out over five days. We all very much felt those five days were like eternity. How does this compare to elections in the past? Well, elections in the past, um, we haven't really changed the way we've counted very much. Uh, and, and to be honest, most elections weren't decided until later when all the uh, election re results are in. And it takes a while to count those votes. So one of the things that happens now is that we are so used to uh, seeing elections come in with 48, 60% of the precincts in a specific state being counted and then saying, well, we're gonna declare this person the winner. We didn't do that this year. We didn't do that this month. And so uh, this is why people are going, well, what's taking so long? It really does take a while to count all those votes. I mean, today we can do some of it electronically, so it's much quicker than it's been in the past, but there are still people who are complaining about some of the archaic methods we're using to count the votes. You talk about the mass amounts of votes, record turnout. About from 1840 to about 1900, you had 70 to 80% of the eligible voters who voted. Now, remember though, though in those days, the eligible voter was much, uh, population was much smaller, basically white males. Uh, and of course, in the years since we've expanded the vote, more and more people could vote. Um, but even as recently as some of the more recent elections, you only have at most 60% of voters who actually show up. So when we talk about that number of votes, that number of ballots coming in, and really how how split and divided the country seems, how do we go forward? Well, I think there's a couple uh, of things we need to keep in, in, in perspective is that one, every time you have a major event, you know, we're talking COVID this cycle, but in the past we've had world wars, we've had the great depression uh, and people really want to see a change. And so more people will go out. The votes are much more, uh, are split. Uh, people thinking one way or the other. And so uh, in, in that respect, we're in a time of crisis. And I think that's reflected in the number of people who are voting and how they are voting. Uh, we need to keep in mind that, you know, for the first time in history, we have a woman of color who is going to be the vice president. And that is tremendous in United States history, just as in uh, President Obama's election, the first time we had an African-American president was a sea change in the American perspective of who our presidents could and should be. We need to look at the power of the women's vote. We need to look at the power of young people. Today, young people make up over 50% of the population uh, and they don't see things the way we've traditionally been framing uh, Democrat and Republican uh, positions, right? They are uh, seeing things from a different way. And they think that kind of our old way of looking at it. We're really kind of in a Cold War mentality yet. We look at the previous elections, they've been very Cold War-ish. We're afraid of communists, we're afraid of socialists, uh, we're afraid of immigrants. And we need to rethink that. Also, we tend to see the, the Latino vote. I can't tell you how many times I've seen the Latinos and how they vote. Minorities don't vote in blocks. Uh, you know, 80% of African-Americans vote Democrat, yes, but 20% vote Republican. Hispanics, males, and uh, various, uh, about 40% of Hispanics vote Republican. So we need to, to rethink how we are focusing things. And, and, and that's not even talking about the number of people who are of mixed heritage. Many young people are of mixed heritage. So they don't see things in those black, white, brown issues the way we did 30, 40 years ago. We need to focus on social welfare reform, uh, immigration reform. We've been talking about that, but have uh, done very little. Health care reform is a big bugaboo. We've done very little about it. Um, economic issues are because of COVID and just the way the economy is changing, big things we need to look at. And I think as we look back as historians, um, we're going to say, you know, these are some of the key points that people were concerned about uh, over the last uh, part of the 20th and certainly into the 21st century. Uh, we also need to look at modernizing the voting process. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many times people have been talking, my friends, my other historian friends 
have been talking about the archaic way we're voting. It's a very 19th century way of voting. Even President Trump said the other day, there is no reason with electronics and technology today that we should have to wait so long to see what the popular vote is. I agree with him on that point. I think he's right on that. Um, so those are some of the things. And also realize that a lot of the issues really go beyond partisan uh, uh, questions, right? It's uh, if we, how do we improve jobs? How do we improve education and educational opportunities? Um, those in Houston flooding, those aren't Republican Democrat issues. And we need to think about how we phrase those. You brought up the word traditional a lot during your comments just now, and a lot of President Trump's presidency has been untraditional. Um, how do you think historians are going to look back on, on not just his presidency, um, but on this transition of power? Do you think this will be traditional? Well, let's hope that it is. I mean, uh, you know, uh, in the 1800s, uh, the 1800 election, which everybody thinks about because of Hamilton and Burr, right? The, the great duel and, and that play that's so popular right now. It's a great play. But part of that had to do with the transition of power in 1800 and how they each stood and Hamilton's role in helping Jefferson get elected over Burr. So uh, that has its roots in something that many young people are, are thinking about today the Hamilton versus Jefferson or Hamilton versus Burr duel. But in 1800, there were armed militia at the White House. So we've had these uh, contested debates, the contested elections before. Uh, they've always played out. And let's hope that the president's advisors uh, are doing what we hear that many of them are saying is that you have to realize that uh, you're not going to be the president anymore. And, and let's hope that it is traditional. Uh, the social media aspect, though, is an important issue. And I think in the, you know, how has social media affected politics in the past 15 years is tremendous. How has it affected uh, reporting? I mean, a our, our lot of, we saw a lot of news agencies change, fewer reporters, uh, and a lot of people are trying to get the story out as quickly as possible. And that has changed the way we report uh, people who are in the media are doing their job. And certainly we as historians are looking at this as well. And I think that's gonna be a big factor in as we look back is how has social media changed the elections? That is such an interesting point. I, and you mentioned how it's changed media. I've been in this job in, for 19 years now. Um, when I was in my third job, Facebook finally started becoming popular and it was banned in the newsroom because it was considered a distraction. And now really? it's one of the main tools that we use to reach out to and connect with viewers. So it's interesting to see how it has evolved over the years in politics too, in politics oh, too. Oh, absolutely. But it's so ubiquitous anymore that uh, we don't, it, it's it almost, you don't even think about it because it's everywhere. Uh, well, let's talk about this because this is a president who used, especially Twitter in a way no other president ever has. Um, and so there's a very different presidential documentation then there's, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's really funny because if you look at how Trump uh, did his campaign, the whole Make America Great Again, that was Ronald Reagan's slogan for the 1980s. And um, I was reading a book about Reagan, uh, and I knew people in his administration. Um, and a lot of it, you know, he was building upon Reagan, but we've kind of forgotten about Reagan and the Reagan Republican era is over it's now gonna have Trump's name on it, I think, uh, as the transition. But unlike Reagan, where there was no social media, social media today in all politics has been a sea change. I mean, from Trump's uh, endless tweets, but it's not just him, right? Other politicians, uh, our county judge, uh, local representatives, city council members have all taken to social media up and down the political spectrum. And that has really changed. And so at one point, and going back to the news media, at one point, I remember when I was a young person, they first started Nightline on, uh, with Ted Koppel. 
And I went to see Ted Koppel in San Antonio give a speech. And he made the statement. He said, people believe 90% of what they see on TV. And therefore, it's incumbent upon reporters to do a good job of fact checking and get the facts out there. Today, we see a distrust in media, the traditional media. But social media has replaced that. And people are willing to believe whatever people say on social media and Facebook without checking, without verifying. And I think that's really uh, problematic. And I think as an educator, we need to do a better job of teaching people how to, um, you know, what churches call discern. How do you take information coming in and evaluate it? And um, now it falls upon us as social media recipients rather than upon reporters who used to do that job for us.